So, uh, so I'm not going to talk about vodka tonight. I, uh, I'm just going to tell you just straight out. Some of the most energy I've ever had in my life is failure. And, uh, and I've learned to take that and, and use it as my strength. And anybody that's ever failed at anything knows that it's, you know, it's intense, you know. And I'll sit up here tonight and I'll talk about a business, you know, going bad or something like that. But when it happened, it sucked. And it hurt real bad. But it gave me a lot of energy. And I'm a geophysicist and, and a geologist. And I've learned to take that energy. And I've learned that if you have a whole lot of energy, that you can use your brain. You can turn it around. And you can turn it into positive energy. And uh, I take failure not so well. I'm very competitive, but uh, I've learned to use my failure in a positive way, make lemonade out of lemons, you know, so to speak. And uh, I hope to inspire somebody tonight to either forgive themselves, or not only that, to, to use their failure to, to be their strength. And so, my talk tonight is a celebration of failure. Now uh, we can start. All right, sorry about that. I got a little emotional there. All right, so this is a B&M lawn specialist. Bowel movement, B&M is like doomed from the get-go. This is the shortest <laughs> business I've ever had. It lasted less than three months. Uh, me and Dick McCaleb, Dick was... Uh, he was 16, I was 15, and since he was the driver, I was the one who had to run up and bang on the door and learn how to do sales. And uh, we killed some shrubs, and, and it didn't go so good. I went to Vanderbilt. I wanted to be a doctor. Nobody in my family had ever been a doctor or a lawyer or anything. And uh, I went and hung out for a few days at Vanderbilt Hospital and realized I don't like being in hospitals. I don't like sick people. You know, I mean, I, I feel for them, but, but uh, I'm a mild germaphobe. <clears throat> Came home that summer. I got a job on a oil rig as a roughneck and uh, I was covered with drill mud one day and a guy comes up and starts blue jeans and, and he was the geologist and uh, they said that guy's worth 17 million bucks and I'd seen too much Dallas and decided right then and there I wanted to be a Texas oil man. <laughs> I went to switch schools, went to University of Texas, I became a geophysicist and geologist. I graduated in 1984 for the decline of the oil business. Oil went to six dollars a barrel, lowest I think it's been for a long time. I uh, got a job at Maverick Operating, got laid off. I started Uno Oil Corporation. It went broke. I moved to Houston, was a seismic data processor, started having dreams of floating down a river in a body bag. I quit and got transferred to Venezuela and Colombia where I ran hella portable dynamite seismic crews. This is my crew in, uh, in the Andes. Oil business got better and I came back and outside of Houston, I started a drilling company doing shot hole seismic drilling. Uh, George Bush Sr. went and did Desert Storm 1. Oil went back down to 10 bucks a barrel. All my contracts said, sue me. And I was broke. I took my stuff to a drill yard, moved to Austin, started hanging out on a friend's couch, got a job with McCulley Frickin' Gilman. Uh, these are groundwater sampling bottles. I uh, spent my time in landfills, um, sulfur dioxide ponds, super fun sites. I was never in Austin. Pour sweat out of my rubber boots. This buddy of mine said, hey man, why don't you come to work with me? You're good in math. Become a residential mortgage broker. So I was working for uh, doing, selling residential mortgages. I loved it. Had a couple of Italian suits, you know, looked good. I was in the air conditioning, title company parties. Rates went up a couple of points, killed my business. So I started my own corporation, that was Fifth Generation Mortgage. Had my home phone and my home address on it. Started making infusions for my friends for Christmas presents. And, uh, and I was uh, doing that and saw a guy on TV. He said, if you're trying to figure out your passion, find something you love to do that you're good at. So I made some infusions, took them to a liquor store. Guy told me I was crazy. He said, flavored vodkas don't sell. If you want to do something, do something smooth, the girl could drink straight. So I got some pictures of some moonshiners from the Institute of Texan Cultures, and I built a small still, and started cooking it off. Found out there'd never been a legal distillery in Texas before. 
and I uh, went down to TABC and told me I couldn't do it and uh, went out and I said well if I had enough money I would so this is a deal I did for 18 million dollars I raised zero it took me six months to go out I talked to 600 and some people I didn't raise a penny it was really disheartening I was very depressed after that <clears throat> went back to the TABC and uh, read the code because I'd read code in the environmental business and MacGyvered in the oil business and uh, I got the uh, got the code and and uh, said well there's no reason you can't do a distillery in Texas and they go well yeah and I said no and not in the code and they go you read the code and I said yeah so I went up to the ATF and and they said if I get a permit with the ATF that uh, that they'd give me a permit, which they ultimately did. Came the first distiller in Texas. These are some of my labels I was going to do. A little before my time, it was 20 years ago, kind Texas vodka. Kind vodka, right? Vodka. What kind? Kind. kind vodka. This is my picante, <laughs> my picante uh, <laughs> vodka I was going to do. So there's another kind bottle there. <clears throat> so uh, these are bottles I could get my hands on stock, and I was like, I get, I get a couple million bucks, you know. I can somebody make me a bottle, look like a perfume bottle, be, you know. I didn't ever raise any, any money to date, and so I started just saying, well, fuck it. I'm just going to go and do it in stock bottles. So I went and I bought 12 acres that I'm still at across from F1, and, uh, and I bought it with a $3,000 credit card check and talked the guy into owner finance and the other 30. That's me hand filling, hand capping, hand labeling out there with my dog distilling, and, and then uh, got my licenses and everything, told everybody, Everybody, I was you know legal to go. No reason not to invest. Went out. This one I went down from 18 million to 240 thousand dollars. That's a rejection letter next to it. I raised zero. Everybody thought I was crazy. So uh, I just decided, you know what? I'm just gonna nut up. I made. Uh, everybody didn't like my kind or anything. So uh, on my prospectus, I had this brown paper because I was dating a vegetarian at the time. So she made me get recycled paper. I did the logo of the pot still on Corel Draw. That's Lucida Calligraphy Bold Italic there. That I picked off a word perfect. I thought it, I don't know if you noticed, but that was fifth generation distilling so that I could answer the phone, whether it was mortgages or vodka. I was always fifth generation. This is the Wall Street Journal after about my sixth or seventh year talking about what a great job I was doing. You know, it's pretty bad when the Wall Street Journal goes up and says that you suck. And, uh, so I ended up going up and, you know, went out of state, came back in state, finally, you know, got it going, made it up the Midwest and the East Coast and the West Coast. Now we're number 57 of the most trusted brands. That's me, the vodka guy with my little bobblehead. <clears throat> so, so my talk here today is about taking your failures in life. For me, it was the oil business and the lawn mowing business, the environmental business, the mortgage business. Just wrapping your arms around them and squashing them up to a little carnation and just putting it right on your lapel and just being proud of all those failures and, and then just turn them into something that you love to do that you're good at. Thank you very much and uh, everybody go get some Tito's Handmade Vodka after this show.